I'd like to thank my patrons for making these videos possible, especially Vlad Mel. You know what, Vlad? Sorry your shout-out wound up in this episode of all episodes, because this is one of those episodes. This episode contains frank discussions of the worst stuff in life. Self-harm, depression, loss, etc. It also contains sincere discussions about those things in my life, a personal person's life. So here's your content warning for cringe. If this kind of oversharing is something you habitually shy away from and you're not comfortable with people talking about their emotions, or if you are sensitive to any of the previously mentioned topics, as I am, you're not missing anything if you skip this one. Go right ahead. Just skip it. Just close the video. Uh, there's no secret drawing techniques in this one. You're not going to be missing out on anything. Also, if you're one of my family members, take seriously that I'll spend time here discussing something that affects both of our lives, and there's no reason that hearing this needs to happen now on YouTube schedule. Don't thrust yourself into this just because this video got served to you by the algorithm. Just click away, and I'll see you next time. And uh, d don't worry, I'm not going to say anything that would upset you. So again, you're really not missing anything. All right, all disclaimers aside, here's where I am with time right now. It's been six years now since my father's suicide. I'm recording this slightly before, but I'll put it out on the uh, six-year marker. Um, I think it's useful to reflect on these things. That's why I'm doing this. And I'm feeling good, I'm feeling very good uh, all of these days and years after. So I thought I'd present a little discussion here about art and loss, or at least how I experienced art and loss, how my art practice helped me through a very difficult time in my life. It was this experience and a handful of others over the course of a lot of time and integration that resulted in this YouTube channel and the things that it focuses on. These experiences made clear to me that the practice of art offers something much more important than an opportunity to fill dead time or a desirable career. What it offers actually humiliates those ideas. It makes those things seem very small indeed. I also want to be clear that my art practice wasn't a distraction or a comfy escape from the grief of my father's death. It was an active, vigorous medicine that challenged me all the way down to my core. It could have been an escape if I had wanted that, but I've never been much of an escaper. Uh, art being structureless, it met me on my level and gave me a way to confront what I was going through head on. My father's death changed a lot for me, everything, I suppose. I was 25 at the time, which I count as lucky. Uh, I was young enough to still find life malleable and old enough and established enough that the revelations and realities around his death were not, in the end, an existential threat to my sense of self-identity. But it did shake me. There's a lot I can't say about it, and that's fine with me because those parts aren't my story to tell, but it was the first time I had an honest encounter with mortality, loss, betrayal, purpose, shame, deception, revelation, and the possibility of real tragedy in life. Like tragedy that actually intersects with your life. I felt like I was always sensitive to that, but I didn't really believe in it. Like, I didn't really believe it could happen to me until it ran over me, you know? Isn't that how it always goes? I was caught off guard by an experience that showed me that really traumatic events, past and present, can be lurking intimately close to home, and they can truly catch you by surprise. I was also served a powerful lesson in uncertainty, that you can't be quite sure that what you're doing is the right thing. 
For example, I wasn't talking to my father for a few months before his death, and for reasons that I thought were good. I had been thoughtful and felt I was within reasonable bounds to protect myself with a little silence and a little distance. I should be clear that with six years of hindsight, I'm not blinded by guilt about this particular point anymore, and I accept that I was doing my best. But back then, after I collided with the reality of the situation and discovered I would actually never talk to him again, well, yes, the feelings of guilt associated with that were life-consuming, an ocean to drown in. It's often called survivor's guilt and tends to come mixed with anger towards the concerned party, a gourmet self-loathing, the full coterie of griefly ghosts, and the kind of dim apathy for anything but your own suffering that can only be called depression. In the penumbral shadow of my father's death, a period of some three-ish years where I kind of went through a lot, I grappled with the pain of having thought I was doing things right, and then upon retrospection, found my thoughtful choices to instead have been the perfect ingredients for personal and interpersonal disaster. That wasn't fun. It, uh, it left me with what seems to be the archetypal choice that arises for all adults at some point. You are given evidentiary knowledge that you cannot control or accurately assess anything in any profound way, and then you are challenged by that to choose to live as if that weren't true, as if you did not know this, lest you be lost to nihilism. To be vexed with such a choice felt tantamount to the devil's perfect torture, with life merely a leering facade dancing brightly before one's eyes, demanding delusional self-deception at every turn. I'm glad to have seen through the trick of that and to have left that behind. That was a, uh, that was a very holy hell indeed. Anyway, I was a comically productive, depressed person. I've always been willing to plunge myself into my work, but looking back, I wish I'd not deceived myself into thinking that was a good thing. I wish I'd taken a longer breath to put my mind back together with whatever help I needed. I thought I could forgive myself and justify my life if I didn't let what happened crush me and continued to make my boss's money. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Being young sucks. What the hell was that about? Uh, and good Lord, uh, we have effectively externalized our identities and self-worth to things like money and aspirational job titles. I thought, well, if everyone outside looks at me and sees that I went through this horrible thing and managed to get back to my little art job with minimal interruption and could shake hands and laugh at meetings and do cool drawings for the clients and all that, then they'll think, wow. Stephen is a pretty strong guy, no? And if they thought that, then that would then be true to some extent. And uh, I don't need to tell anyone over the age of six that these are the desperate thrashings of a boy who had spent too much of his life trying to prove something. But I noticed something remarkable about my art practice at that time, which is that it worked. No matter how black the cloud, no matter how electric the stinging of my skin, no matter the immensity of my self-disappointment, if I sat down to draw, if I stuck with it just a bit, it would all go away. I would go away. I would go through flow periods where things occurred naturally, and the imagined self was not present. And when I would have active thoughts, they were about the art, and that part of my life was a sanctuary of familiarity and peace. If that weren't weird enough, the art was fine. Not good, just, just what it had always been. Some stuff was good, some stuff was bad, some was neutrally mediocre. I could have overlooked that, and I'm glad I didn't. That was my first glimpse, really, really my first glimpse of a truth that I talk about on this channel constantly, that your feelings don't have anything to do with the art. You can do your worst pieces at your most focused, confident, and capable, and your best pieces 
at your most depressed, small, and constricted, and vice versa, of course. The art practice is bigger than our momentary feelings. So my practice started serving me these dual purposes. It helped me calm my mind when I really needed it, and it proved to me over and over again that the intense feelings I was experiencing did not necessarily need to determine things in my life. Now, that doesn't mean I lived as if that were true, but it was slowly deteriorating my certainty that if I felt as bad as possible, then life was as bad as possible. Eventually, the weirdness and interest of these revelations produced a new feeling in me, one I had perhaps not felt since childhood. I wanted to draw for myself, for drawing's own sake. I had not wanted to do this for most of my conscious memory. I had always wanted to draw to improve. I loved drawing, and I always felt comfortable trying things and drawing all sorts of things in all sorts of ways and drawing with ambition and drawing lazily, but I was comfortable with that because I had good reason to believe any time spent drawing would contribute to improvement. And I had explicitly moved toward my goal of being a professional artist whose practice was validated by its desirability to clients for about 11 years at that point, something like that. And I had actually achieved that goal after about eight years, but it's never enough, as you know. And honestly, I never much thought about anything but that. I never wanted to do my own thing. I never wanted to just make art. I pursued getting good with single-minded determination and vigor. And I never imagined a future where I had a highly personal relationship with my art. I know that might sound weird, from this end, you know, seeing my YouTube channel and hearing the things that I talk about all the time now, but I'm being completely serious. Before my father died, I never cared about having a personal relationship with my art. Maybe I would have if I had ever taken a minute to think about it, but like I said, uh, I make for a comically productive depressed person, so you should see me when I'm happy. Uh, I had no time for ruminations like that. I only had time for my monumental long-term goal. I say all this to try to highlight how very weird it was for me to feel differently. To say that it required some self-reassessment is an understatement. I found it disturbing, which is weird on paper. I was disturbed by the desire to spend some time drawing without a goal for its own sake instead of some sneaky ego preening ulterior motive yeah yeah i was i was disturbed by that i told you i was messed up it was not fun to look around at my current state having struggled valiantly for a very difficult long-term goal and having achieved some considerable success with it and ask myself why did i think this was it that this was what i really wanted and as a goal-oriented person, imagine my surprise to find that the next thing that was calling me was not a new goal to set milestones for and to chew towards, but instead it was something that was already present, already fully delivered. It was something so intimate and close that I overlooked it. It wasn't even that it was right under my nose. It was more like it was my eyes, that for all my efforts, I had confused the figure for the field. Well, to say the least, I had plenty to laugh at myself for. And the laughter did come, after a while. Rolling, all-consuming laughter, a, a beautiful counter to the oceanic despair I had felt before. I mean, I felt fucking saved. I felt so lucky. Too lucky too lucky to have realized it early. I could see, I could still see, how I could have gone my whole life missing it. I reoriented in a very fundamental way. My practice was invoking me to stay with it, 
to be present, to relish in it moment to moment, instead of childishly wielding it at specters I had conjured myself, or, God help me, to define my self-worth by my ability to be taken advantage of by employers. <laughs> That's one I can always think of when I need a good laugh. And yeah, if this all sounds like it's only about drawing, it is, but it was caused by my dad's death. The surprise and violence of that event made enough whitewash flake off the walls of my miserable little cathedral that I could see the paintings underneath for the first time. It was all tied up together. I was primed for a severe change because my thoughts were operating on a very severe level, obsessing over stuff that's too big for anyone to hold easily. Mortality, what it means to live an examined and intentional life, the relationship between ourselves and our shames and glories, these dreary philosophical planes, grown forlorn and wild with the brambled opinions of history's most astute minds, are not easily navigated while the heart collapses under its own density. But the friction certainly produced energy, and sometimes change requires great energy. There's a part of me that hates talking about this stuff, because I worry it can give the wrong impression to some young or beginner artists, that surviving a trauma is needed to propitiate the most esoteric art muses and lure them to your shoulder. That's stupid. I wouldn't wish what I went through on anyone. And after spending a considerable amount of time in the community of survivors, I've learned that meaning-making is not a path to healing for everyone. But I do think it's useful for artists to be skillful at integrating the lessons life throws at them, no matter how intense. Life is going to trample all of us whether we like it or not. None of us will escape these lessons. The question, I suppose, is whether you will be willing to let your practice interface with them when they arise, or if you will erect an emotional wall around the practice that keeps it isolated from the turmoil of your life. I think everyone needs something different. Either option is valid, but I'm a syncretist at my core. I take it as an axiom that all things are influencing each other, born of the same reality and linked, even if the nature of that linkage is something utterly outside the grasp of these particular biologies. As such, I found myself wanting my practice to interact with what was going on, to communicate with my life, and it did. I can't imagine what the hell I would be doing now, what I would be drawing now, if I hadn't allowed that to happen. Everything about my current practice is informed by the things that I learned in that tumultuous time. In some sense, every drawing I do is a pilgrimage back to that period of great opening and unknowing. And I've gained so much from that at this point that, crazy as it is to say, I can't ultimately regret everything that happened, even my father's death. And that is, of course, a kind of healing you can hardly dare to ask for. Well, with that, I suppose I will end this episode here with a, a remembrance of my father. I won't subject you to it. I'll just sit here for a second. Thanks, Dad. Thank you, Heidel. All right. Now let me just say here, in conclusion, that if you're someone who has lost someone in this way, um, my heart is with you. You know, it's a, it's a very hard thing. 
and take care of yourself. You need to take care of yourself. Um, don't convince yourself you don't need therapy. You definitely need <laughs> therapy. Survivor support groups are great as well. There's certain things about the experience that can only be learned by sitting across from someone who went through the same thing, I think. And, uh, and if you recoil from all of that, if you feel like you're the kind of person for whom all of that is inappropriate, and this is something you really need to get through on your own, I wish you the most divine ability to heal yourself. And if you're someone who's struggling with uh, feelings or worries of self-harm and depression, there's always people who are willing to listen. And the number for the suicide prevention hotline in the United States is 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. I'm going to go draw for a while. Thanks for drawing today.